two, three, four. Good morning. It's good to see you guys. Let's stand and sing. Let's worship together. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, we're standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fail. Storms of doubt and fear are saved by the living word of God. A shall prevail. I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. My Savior, standing, standing. God, I'm standing on the promises. you're here today and we want to welcome you to minor baptist church if you're watching online and we welcome you into our services as well and we're glad that you're watching again we're glad that you're here and i hope god will bless you today we're in the middle of a new series or not the middle of the beginning really we started last week the marks of a true believer and we'll be continuing that series today last week we looked about the fact that the mark of a true believer is being born again uh, that's the very first birthmark you have to have and if you don't have that one uh, then you don't, you're not a true believer. And today we're going to be looking at prayer. In fact, for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at prayer. Uh, real believers pray. Uh, is that a surprise to you? It shouldn't be. True believers pray. 
And so I hope you'll be looking at your prayer life while we're doing that. And speaking of that, it's time for prayer. And so uh, let's pray today. And uh, I, th I think today, and, and unless there's somebody that would like to be anointed today, is there somebody wants to be anointed today? If not, I think we're just going to pray from right where we're at then. I don't see anybody. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, first of all, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you're in the midst of us. Father, you said where two or three are gathered together, there you will be. And today, as we gather for worship, Lord, we know that you are here. And so, Lord, may we truly worship you in spirit and truth this morning. Father, we pray for the world that we live in right now. Not just our country, but the whole world. Lord, it seems like the world is on fire and gone crazy. And Father, we just pray that a great awakening would come, a great revival would come, and Father, that it would begin right here with us, in our hearts, even as we look in the marks of a true believer. And Father, we pray as that great revival comes, it will sweep this nation and sweep the world and change the world, because Lord, I believe we're get, reaching a point where the, Lord, the world is unchangeable without that great revival. Father, if you choose not to bring that revival, then as we look at the scripture, it seems like maybe it's time, maybe you're coming after us. So, Lord, we pray it would be one or the other, but, Father, deliver us from this evil world that we live in where the great awakening would be our first choice. But, Lord, we are willing to follow you and your will and your way. Father, we pray for those this morning that are having uh, difficulties that we've been praying for on Sunday mornings. Lord, I pray for my wife who's not here today, not feeling very well today. Uh, Father, we pray you'd be with her. And, Father, I thank you that her report wasn't worse than it was, but, Lord, we're praying for a better report next time. Father, I, I pray for TCA, and I thank you for the good stu school year they're having and the good start they've had and the way you've met their needs financially. Pray for Mike as he leads them, Lord. Just bless TCA. Father, I pray for Teresa Tumbleson. And Father, I pray she'd feel your presence and your love surrounding her. Father, just bless her and be at work in her life and bring your healing hands upon her. Lord, we pray for Christy Hawkins. And Father, again, we pray your continued healing in her life and your healing hands upon her. Pray for Hattie McDowell and her, her continued healing, Lord, as she takes treatments. And Father, I pray for Janet Sullivan at home as she's been taking treatments and as she recovers from those uh, right now and takes a break from those. Father, I pray for Lana and I pray, Lord, that she would uh, continue to claim her healing and Father, continue to heal up. Father, pray for Glenn Post and bless him in his recovery and Beverly Self. Lord, give her answers, Lord. I know it's been a, a rough time for her and and one week up, one week down, most of the weeks down. And Father, just reach out and touch her in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Father, we continue to pray for Alex Powderly, the young man with a tumor in his spine, and Hannah Caldwell and Andy Amalone. Father, just pray you touch each one of those. Lord, I know there are others that are here today that have special needs, and I didn't call their names. And so, Father, those that we called and those who are praying to you right now and, and, and lifting their needs up to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus and by the power of his shed blood, we pray you'd move in a mighty way and bring your healing power into their lives. Father, just bless them. Father, most of all, we pray that you'd bring revival. Most of all, we pray you'd bring revival in our hearts. Father, may our prayers not just be about our physical needs, but may they be about our spiritual needs. May they be about surrender to you. And Father, may those physical needs lead us to greater surrender to you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
be seated. Do you remember that uh, when Daniel was accused because he prayed? Do you remember that? The king said, uh, Pharaoh said, not Pharaoh, I'm sorry, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, nobody should pray to anybody except to me. And what happened? Daniel prayed to God anyway. He was heard. Those who were jealous of him took him in. He was thrown into the lion's den. I wonder, is there enough evidence that you have a prayer life that you could be convicted because of your prayer life? And this morning we're going to use three weeks we're going to be talking about prayer as a true mark of a true believer. And we're going to start with the most famous prayer of all, and I'm going to sing it to you this morning.
Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. The Lord's Prayer, which I just sang, the first part of the prayer and the last part of the prayer begins with worship. So as we look at three parts of prayer over the next three Sundays, the first one is worship. Our prayer life should begin with worship. Our prayer life should end with worship. And so we want to talk about what worship is this morning as part of our prayer life. As we talk about worship, it says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's worship. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's worship. And then at the end, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That is worship. That is worshiping Almighty God. And so today we're going to look at worship in two categories, all right? The first category we're going to look at is corporate worship. That's what we supposedly do on Sunday morning. The second category we're going to look at is your private worship. And by the way, both should be a part of your life if you're a true believer. Corporate worship and private worship. If you don't ever come to corporate worship, if I came to you on the street and said, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? And you said, yes. And I said, where do you go to church? And you said, I don't go. You don't have the marks of a true believer. You may be one, but you sure don't look like one. You don't act like one. True believers find a place to worship God. You say, well, I got mad at my church. They didn't treat me right. Well, go to another one. I mean, it's easy to do in this town. There's plenty of them, right? And let's just be honest. Brother Ron told me this years ago. I'll put you on the spot, Brother Ron. People change churches in this town like they trade cars. There's plenty of churches to go to. And so the bottom line is, if you're not happy in the one you're at and it's keeping you from attending, find one where you can be happy. Worship the Lord. If you are a true believer, you ought to be worshiping the Lord. Now, the benefit of staying in the same congregation for a long period of time, as I know as well as some of you do, because I've been here 24 years, is you get to know people and they become your family of God around you. And it's just an awesome thing to have that support system and to have those people around you, people who love you and care about you and will, will do whatever it takes to help you. But a true believer is a part of corporate worship. And corporate's a word you need to understand. Let's be real clear, okay? It doesn't mean Facebook. That is not corporate worship. That is participating in worship uh, in, a, in a limited way. And because of COVID, I totally understand that. But if you're still staying home from worship and watching on Facebook, and that you think that's your corporate worship, and yet you go to Walmart, you go to the ball games, you go everywhere else, then you need to check out your Christianity. You need to check, check out whether you're really acting like a true believer. And if you're at home and I'm making you mad right now, so be it. That's the word of God. We should not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Again, there are reasons, okay? There are reasons. If you're Health is compromised, and if you're afraid of this new Delta variant, and you're afraid of all those kind of things, and you feel like the Lord wants you to be safe for a while, there's nothing wrong with that, if that's the real reason. If the real reason is you don't have to get out of your pajamas, that's not a good reason. So uh, I may be offending some of our Facebook crowd, but that's okay. It probably won't be long before they cancel me on Facebook anyway. So I just want you to understand that Corporate worship is what we do as a church. Looking back on it now, I think we made a mistake when we closed down for a couple months because of COVID. 
I really do. Corporate worship is important. It's vital. It's essential. It's just as essential as everything else that a Christian does. So let's talk about corporate worship. And then later we'll talk about private worship. And those of you here are going to say, hey, I'm at corporate worship, so he's not talking about me. Well, we'll see. We'll see what corporate worship really is, all right? Because I'm going to talk about me some too, all right? Corporate worship. God's son fervently worshiped in spirit and truth brings down his glory at church. It brings the glory of God down. You remember we, we spent so much time on this vertical relationship between us and God. And as we worship vertically, it brings the glory of God into our presence. But not only at church, by the way, when we get there later, it also happens in our individual prayer lives. When was the last time you worshiped God to the point at home in one of your moments of prayer with God where the glory of God surrounded you all by yourself? It can bring it down there too. So worship is such an important part of prayer, whether it's privately or whether it's corporately. I, I like to call worship this, unashamed adoration. Unashamed adoration. Some of you have figured out over these 24 years that I'm not ashamed of the way I adore my wife. I've been very clear about that to the point of embarrassing her many times. I adore her. And we, shouldn't be un we should not be ashamed of our adoration of God. That's even more important. Unashamed adoration of God means you don't care who knows it. You don't care who sees it. If God says, lift your hands, you're not worried about the person behind you. You might say something's wrong with him. He's got his hands in the air. If God says, keep your hands to your side and worship with your head down, you're not going to be ashamed of that either. You're not ashamed of worshiping God however he leads you to worship. Unashamed adoration. Why does worship matter in our prayer life? Let's be very clear. When it comes to our prayers, worship is the most powerful thing we do. Worship is the most powerful thing we do. Expressing our love to the most worthy object of our love, that's the most powerful thing we do. What did Jesus say? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Now, we use that scripture a lot when it comes to tithing and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line, is your heart with Jesus? Are you a true believer? Do you love Jesus with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, just like he commanded us to do in Matthew chapter 22? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. If where our treasure is is where our heart is, then do you understand and do you see that one of the greatest sins in our life cannot be what we do that we shouldn't do? One of the greatest sins in our lives as a Christian should be directing that adoration that we should have towards God somewhere else and putting other things on a pedestal and never finding the time to worship God because of what he's done for us. And when we don't truly worship God, we are missing the greatest joy that we were created for. There's a new song out, I think it's by Phil Wickham, Joy in the House of the Lord. Now, when I hear that song, it makes me want to go to church and have joy in the house of the Lord. And sometimes I think we come, and of course it's early, it's 9 o'clock, and we're not awake yet, and we're just having a hard time finding joy in the house of the Lord. Man, we ought to come, and there ought to be joy among us because we are delivered, we are saved, we are born again, we are on our way to heaven, and nothing in this life can stop that. I don't know about you, that that brings joy into my heart and into my life, and it ought to bring joy into us, and it ought to bring worship into our lives, but so many times we begin to worship everything else. You've probably heard this story again, but I just thought it fit here. I've heard it before, but I thought it fit here really well. We had the privilege several years ago to eat dinner with Albert Pujols. Now, if you don't know who Albert Pujols is, you know nothing, absolutely nothing about baseball and the St. Louis Cardinals. We ate in his restaurant. He paid for it. There was a, a small room full of people. Casting Crowns was there. We were there. The Lincolns were there and a few other people, and that's about it. We had this really cool meal. 
We got to talk to him a lot afterwards. But, but as we were preparing for the meal, Albert got up from his table and he went to the men's room. Luke saw Albert get up and go to the men's room. Luke said, oh, I need to go to the men's room too. <laughs> and so Luke went to the men's room. He got the chance to talk to Albert. They were in the men's room, standing up, doing what men do in the men's room. We won't go any farther than that. Albert was right next to Luke. Men, we don't usually talk to each other in the men's room, do we? Al, Luke looked over at Albert. He said, Albert, I want you to know you're my favorite baseball player. Albert said, thank you. And Luke said, but I want you to know it's not because of how good you are on the field. It's because of the Christian witness I see in you that you publicly proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So Luke's adoration only had a, a small limit. His main adoration was with the Lord and the witness for the Lord that was going on there. You see, sometimes our adoration is misdirected. When you begin to adore people in politics or people in Hollywood or people that play sports more than you do the Lord, it's misplaced. It's misplaced. And let me say this, because so many of our churches are missing it. So many. I had lunch with, with uh, Kenny this week, our representative from the Baptist home, Kenny Vauder. And he said, Mitch, I'm in different churches every Sunday. All different sizes. Different churches every Sunday. And besides yours and a couple of others, I go in every Sunday and it's dead. There's nothing going on. There's no worship. Well, they, they call it that, right? But there's no spirit of God alive at work. And he said, it, it's just sad. You need, we need to understand that to fail to worship, write this down if you're writing stuff down, to fail to worship is the greatest failure the church can have. To fail to worship is the greatest failure the church can have. When a church places real worship as their ultimate priority, they become shaped by that adoration of the Lord, and they become a powerful, powerful church. As we truly worship God, on Sunday mornings, as we truly lift our hearts to him, as we truly look to him as he comes down to us and we feel his presence, that's where the power of the church is. That's the reason when we pray on Sunday mornings, God answers. That's the reason that God is moving in this church. That's the reason that he has led us to begin to pray for great revival and for spiritual awakening. Worship is directly related to the power that's in that church. Have you ever thought of it that way? Lord, help us to be a church that worships without reservation. Father, help us not to be a church that sings to each other. Help us not to be a church that does good music. Help us to be a church that worships you that our whole first part of our service is designed and to bring us to real worship, to bring us to the point that we are seeking you and asking you to fill our services and come down. Corporate worship. So what is worship? What is worship? Is coming to church services worship? And the answer is no. We may call it a worship service. Don't we call it a worship service? What time do you have worship service? What's it, 9 o'clock on Sunday morning? 6 o'clock on Sunday night? We may call it a worship service, but we need to understand that worship only happens when we make the effort to worship. If you come in on Sunday morning, you may be in a worship service, but if you're playing games right now on your cell phone, you're not worshiping. <laughs> I saw one. Of the, just saw a son point at his mom. <laughs> If you're thinking about what you're going to have for lunch later, you're not worshiping. If you're thinking about all the list of things you got to do as soon as you can get out of here, you're not worshiping. Just because you're here doesn't mean you are worshiping. The Hebrew word 
Translated worship literally means this, to fall or lie down, face down, before someone on the ground touching your forehead on the earth. Think about that. When was the last time that God moved you so much you got on your face? Now, I realize if some of you got on your face, you couldn't get back up. I get that, okay? But when was the last time God moved you to the point that it drove you to your knees? When was the last time that God moved you to the point that you literally prostrated yourself in front of him? Prostrated yourself. When was the last time? Now, I admit, I don't do that a lot at church, but I do it a lot at home. I do it a lot at home. And I've done it in church before. That's what worship means. It means you are so moved that you just want to fall at his feet. Worship is the magnification of Almighty God and the minimization of myself. Worship is when we realize how small we are and how big God is. John the Baptist put it this way, he must increase and I must decrease. You remember when he said that? Worship is the direct, intentional outpouring of unashamed adoration to God. Am I, am I being clear? Are you getting this? It's not just singing a song or two. Worship is laying it all on the line and say, God, here I am. I love you with all my heart. I love what you've done for me. I'm so excited about what you did for me on the cross. I'm so excited about the resurrection. I'm excited that I don't have to worry about anything in this life because I know in the next, Lord, no matter how bad it is in this life, I'm going to be with you forever. And Lord, because of that, I love you more than anything else I love, and I give you the praise and the glory. That's worship. And you may not say those exact words, but that's the condition of your heart and many times we put it to music and that's okay we don't have to though some of you are just not musically inclined some of you are just not there but many times we put it to music psalm chapter 29 verses 1 and 2 in the new king james version says this give unto the lord O you mighty ones give unto the lord glory and strength give unto the lord the glory due his name worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So what is worship? Worship is your whole person unashamedly adoring God's great son, Jesus. Most of us grew up singing hymns. And there's a lot of great hymns out there that teach good theology. But we need to be careful. Because many of us, especially growing up in the Baptist church, many of us learn to worship from the shoulders up. It's all in the head. We never got to the heart. You know, it's, it's wonderful to sing some of the great old hymns of the faith and that teach wonderful theology. But at some point, we got to get to the point where we're lifting our heart to God, not just our mind. Lifting our heart to God and not just our mind. In real worship, we don't worship just with the mind. We don't worship just with the heart. In real worship, we worship with our whole being. Now, I realize I've been in some churches where they do that so well, you think they're a little crazy. And I'm not saying we need to be crazy, all right? I'm just saying we ought to be worshiping from the tip of our toes to the top of our head. And when we worship, we ought to worship. And if we come into this service... And we leave this service and we never approach anything like real worship, then you have missed out. And there was no joy in the house of the Lord for you today. You missed it. It's so important. So important. Nothing brings down the glory of God faster than a worshiping church. Not just a few people on the front rows. But the church as a whole, truly worshiping. Some of you may find this hard to believe, but you know you can actually worship on the back row. I mean the very back row against the wall. And you can worship from the balcony. You think you're hiding up there? God knows where you're at. 
You can worship from the balcony. You can worship from the back row. You can worship from the front row. You can worship from the middle. You can worship wherever you are in the building. You can literally even worship in the nursery with the TV on. That's a little harder. If you can get the kids to start praising the Lord, maybe you can join them. That's a little harder. Are you worshiping with your whole mind, your whole emotions, and your whole being? And what about preaching versus worship? We don't worship so the preaching will be better. It's kind of a false idea. Now, I believe that the worship should lead up to a point where the people have worshiped and they're ready to hear the Word of God. But we don't worship so the preaching will be better. We preach so the worship will be better. We teach the Word of God so the worship will be better. We teach the Word of God so you'll have more reason to worship and you'll understand why you worship. And the worship will be better. Lord, help us to worship with everything that we are. When we come together, Lord, may we be a church that truly worships. And Lord, we may not look that much different on the outside, but Lord, on the inside, may we just be filled with the Spirit and filled with worship. May it rise up out of us in great adoration to you, Lord. Help us to worship. It also says we should worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 23, but the hour is coming and it is here now when true worship will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That hour has come, folks. It's here. We are living in the days when it's time to worship God in spirit and truth. Worship God like we've never worshiped God before. If you're like me and you've been in church since you were old enough to be in the nursery, it kind of, come, it kind of can just become a habit. And that's not going to get it done. It's not just a habit. We ought to look forward. When you wake up on Sunday morning, it shouldn't be, oh my, oh me, got to be there at 9 o'clock. And one of the funniest things I hear from retired people who can sleep late every day of the week is, well, I just can't get up that early on Sunday. One thing I hear from working people is, I got to get up at 6 o'clock every other day. I don't want to get up that early on Sunday. No excuses, folks. Worship is worship. This is the Lord's day. It's not your day. It's the Lord's day. You may think it's your day. You may think it's your day that you got this to do or that to do, or you're going to play this game, or you're going to do that, or you're going to do the other, and you may think it's your day, but I want you to get it. The Bible says very clearly, Sunday is the Lord's day, and when you make it yours, you sin. Y'all ready to retire me yet? When you make it yours, you sin. We are to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. What does it mean to worship the Lord in truth? John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Real worship is guided by the Word of God. It's by, guided by the words of Jesus. And so we worship Him in truth. You know, I, I've heard stories about people in their worship barking like dogs and doing all kinds of weird stuff. Well, show me that in the Word of God and I'll be okay with it. We don't need excesses. We need to worship God in truth, the truth of the Word of God, the way he taught us to worship. My Bible says raise holy hands before the Lord, doesn't it? It doesn't say bark like a dog, but it does say to, to raise holy hands before the Lord. Baptists have been so backward in their worship for so many years that we're scared to do anything that might look a little bit charismatic. Aren't we? Let's just be honest. We're scared of that. Well, get set free and you'll be surprised what God will do in your life. I don't mean be a charismatic. I mean just relax in worship and do what God leads you to do. Not only to worship him in truth, which is Jesus and Jesus alone, by the way. He's the truth. 
there is no other. But we should worship him in spirit. And I don't believe that when John wrote this, he meant in the Holy Spirit. I believe he meant you worship him with your spirit. With our spirit, we worship the Lord. Again, we should worship God from that deepest place within us, our own spirit. It should be a whole person experience. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. If you're one of the, those guys that tells your wife that you told her you loved her when you married her at the altar, and if it ever changes, you'll let her know, and you never say it, Lord, help you. Lord, help you. You see, if it's real, you say it. If it's deep in your heart, you can't keep it back. It just comes out of your mouth. I know some of you guys were raised in a home where emotions weren't expressed, and that's hard for you. Just let it go. God will bless it. <clears throat> if you haven't told your wife for a week or two that you loved her, try it and see what happens. Now, don't do it right when the service is over because they're going to know I put you up to it. Wait to a different time, all right? Do you love God? Do you love what he's done for you? Do you love what he did for you at the cross? Do you love it? Then you worship him with all of your spirit. So the first question was, why do we worship? And the answer is because the Lord changed our lives. He's blessed us with a new life now, and he's given us eternal salvation. And all that we are or ever will be comes from him. And what better reason could we have? to worship i think we just have grown used to the idea that we're saved we've grown used to the idea that jesus died for our sins on the cross we've grown used to the idea that he rose from the dead we've grown used to the idea that if he takes us out of this life and it's our time to go and our, our days are numbered and when, when it's our time to go that we're going to heaven man how can we get used to that but we do don't we we have been safe and secure in Christ for so long that we forget about the price he paid. We forget about the love that he had for us that caused him to go to that cry, cross, and we forget that he loved us enough to draw us to him in salvation. Corporate worship. Second one, private worship. Private worship. Everything that we just said applies to private worship as well. You know, I spent many years in the church as a worship leader. One of the young ladies here a while ago when I was practicing said something about my voice, and I said, well, I, I majored in voice in college. I was a voice major. I spent the first 17 years of my ministry leading youth and leading worship in churches. And I knew all about church worship. I knew how to put together a service that would help the people come to the throne of God. I knew how to put together a service that would draw people in to that time of worship in the auditorium. And I worshiped in the church with all my heart, but let me be real honest here. I didn't always worship so well privately. That was a hard one for me. I worshiped publicly. And I knew the value of public worship. I remember, I still remember the day. I will never forget the day. It'll be on my heart for eternity. We were in Houston, Texas. Before I came here, this was right after I came here. Before I came here, I preached at Ava Missionary Baptist Church. It was just two little sections. Luke and his friend Bradley would sit about halfway back on this side. And at least once a month, I'd say, Luke and Bradley, be quiet and pay attention. It's not good to be a preacher's kid sometimes. We'd get home and I'd get on to Luke because we'd be singing hymns and he'd be sitting there with his mouth shut. Now, I realize some people are scared to death to sing. All right, I'm not talking about you, but Luke can sing. I knew he could sing. And he did not open his mouth during the time of the hymn. He did not really worship. He was just there because mom and dad 
made him be there. And by the way, while I'm on that subject, if you are a parent and you are a Christian, your kids ought to be in church. If they're living in your house, it ought to be a rule they come to church. And if they can't do that, then tell them to get out and find their own place. I believe that with all my heart. Children should not be given a choice whether to go to church or not. We didn't give ours one, obviously. And y'all didn't want us to give them one either, did you? I can hear it now. If we'd let them stay home on Sunday mornings, well, you know, the preacher's kids don't even come. If Cindy stayed home on Sunday morning, it'd be, well, the preacher's wife doesn't even come. You expect it from me. Why wouldn't you expect it from yourself? We're in Houston, Texas. Of course, when we first went to Ava, it was three hymns, you know, the old style. We eventually got a band going and got things revved up a little bit. But we're in Houston, Texas. A bunch of guys that I know were on the stage leading in worship. There's 150, 200 kids there, all gathered around in this deaf church. It was a great place to meet because we stayed in the deaf church all week, and even when they had church, they didn't know we were there because they were deaf. So they could make all the noise we wanted. And so we're having worship one night. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in charge of that week. And I look over, and Luke is on the first or second row on the far end of this circle. And I'm over here. And I looked over, and Luke had his face lifted to heaven. He was singing with all of his heart, even had his hands up a little bit. And I said, God, he got it finally. He finally got it. He knows what worship is now. And by the way, it changed him. It changed him. But I, I've not always been as good at private worship. I thought, I spend all this time as a youth minister or later all this time as a pastor preparing sermons. I'm in the Word all week long getting ready to preach, getting ready to teach. And I pray when I have something to pray about, and surely that's good enough. I got convicted about that. I struggled to maintain that regular time of prayer and worship in my life. Am I speaking to some of y'all now? Some of y'all in that same place? I struggled with it for a long, long time. I finally learned that picking up my Bible and reading it for God to speak to me, not for me to get prepared to speak to you, for God to speak to me was invaluable. And I finally learned that it was so important that I set aside a special time every day to spend some time with the Lord, to read his word and to pray and to hear what he had to say to me. And I finally learned that it was one of the most important things I could ever do. And when I did, it changed my teaching, it changed my preaching, it changed everything about me. Now, obviously, I'm a music person. So music has always been a part of my private worship, too. There's been different songs that God has laid on my heart over the years that, that for a time period had kind of become the theme song of my worship before God. And sometimes when I'm doing my prayer time in the morning, Cindy's not up yet, so I have to be careful how loud I sing in the other room. One of the examples of that is, I will serve thee. Because I love thee, thou hast given life to me. Just good old songs of worship. And there's been many over the years. Usually I get stuck on one for a while and got to move me on to another one. Maybe you're not a singer and that's okay. But there sure ought to be a time of adoration to the Lord. Lord, help us to find that time in our prayer closets. Help us to find a daily time to worship you, a daily time to pray, a daily time to let you touch our hearts and lives and prepare us for the day ahead. Oh, God, if we're not doing that, burden our hearts. We're so busy. We're all busy. But, Lord, if we're too busy for you, we're too busy. Lord, give us that time. Last part of the Lord's Prayer says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Well, the second part, actually, in earth as it is in heaven. 
You see, that model prayer is great prayer. A lot of people can quote it from memory, and a lot of denominations and churches, they say it together every day. It's a great example of how to pray. I don't think it's meant to be your prayer that you pray every time. It's Jesus showing us what the elements of prayer should be. But as I look at that, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're really asking God to do in our prayer time is to do immediately in our presence what he's continually doing in the throne room of God, of heaven. We're asking God just to transfer what he's doing in heaven right down into our lives, right down into our churches until that time that we go to heaven. We're looking for God's kingdom here on earth. We should be praying for his manifest presence in our lives. We should be praying for his manifest presence in this church. We ought to be praying for his manifest presence in this service. And we ought to be praying for his manifest presence in our prayer closet. You say, well, I, I just don't really feel God in my life. I pray, but I don't feel anything. Seems like I'm not getting through. Well, there could be various reasons. Maybe you're on a hold. Maybe God's saying, wait. It's coming, just wait. Just wait. Maybe your prayers are not being answered because there's a barrier between you and God. What does the Bible say the barrier is between you and God that keeps you from getting through? I want you to think about it this way. When you pray in this place, this is a great place to pray, by the way. Sometimes I come in here during the week, get on my knees and pray right here. This seems like a great place to pray. If you pray in this place and there's nothing between you and God that's wrong, your prayers just go right on through that roof and right to him. But that roof could represent your sin. You see, when we have cherished sin in our heart, the Bible says he doesn't hear our prayers. So when we have cherished sin in our heart, it's like there's a spiritual roof built up over us and we're not getting through it. That's why next week we're going to talk about repentance and confession in your private prayer life. Get the stuff out of the way so God will hear. We're just asking God to be at work right here. And sometimes, let's be honest, our prayers are self. We all do it, don't we? I mean, what's my number one prayer request right now? My wife. Sometimes our prayers are selfish. And sometimes we're more concerned about our little kingdom than we are the kingdom of God. And it really shows if our whole life is made up of prayer requests. If all you do is ask and you never worship and you never repent, then it shows where you're at in your prayer life. There are four things that I want to close with here that I believe Christians pray for that are false worship. They're not bad things, and it's okay when they're done in the right order. But there are four things that if we're not careful, they become false worship. These things should come after we focus on worship and on the Lord. Number one is ourselves. If our highest goal in life is happiness, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. God's presence in our lives is not necessarily there to make us happy. It'll make us joyful, but it's not really there to make us happy. Our culture says, do whatever you want when you want to do it. Say whatever you want. Well, not anymore. You get canceled. Be whoever you want. Be with whoever you want, etc. But that's not who we are as Christians. We're not that concerned about our own little word, world as Christians. We need to be who and what Jesus wants us to be. And when we get to where we're who and what Jesus wants us to be, everything else will take care of itself. Yes, we may not be happy all the time, but let me tell you, the joy of the Lord will fill us up when we're what Jesus wants us to be. So be careful about praying for yourselves before you've prayed for God to fill you and take care of you, fill you up. Secondly, our careers. Thank God for jobs. If you got one, you ought to be thankful you got one. Thank God for our jobs. 
but our identity should never be tied up in our job. Now, you're hearing this from the guy whose job is to be the pastor of this church. My identity is not tied up in being the pastor of this church. It's one of the reasons I don't like people calling me reverend, because that gives me an identity. Brother's okay, I'm a Christian. But I learned a long time ago that my identity cannot be tied up in full-time ministry. My first adoration, what I adore most in this life, what I spend the most time on in this life should be the Lord Jesus. You say, aren't the two the same? No, they're not. They're not the same. If you did what I do for a while, you'd see that very quickly. You can get pulled this direction and that direction and this direction, and the next thing you know, you haven't prayed and you haven't spent time with God other than praying with people because you're getting pulled that direction all the time. And if you're not careful, it's all about the ministry, growing the church, preparing those sermons, being everything else, and not about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And when the relationship with Jesus Christ is not where it ought to be, the rest of it falls down. Your job can become your idol. If you've got a job that you love, it can become your idol if you're not careful. Don't put it ahead of God. Young people, most of you don't have careers yet, but you play sports, you play music, you do drama. You've got something you're interested in, surely. Don't let it become your God. Don't let it become your God. Third one, ourselves, our careers, our possessions. It's not wrong to have things, but it's wrong when things have you. You get the difference, right? It's okay to have stuff, but when things have you, it's wrong. Psalm 62.10 says, if riches increased, set not your heart upon them. Everything we have is from the Lord and should be available to the Lord. You remember the rich young ruler when Jesus said, give away all that you have that the poor went away sorrowful. In December, we went looking for a car. Didn't want to buy a car. My Prius was going to be my car for a long time to come. After all, it's a Toyota Prius. I'd been told it'd go 300,000 miles. I was expecting 300,000 miles. At 187,000 miles, it died. And they told me that's really unusual for a Prius. I'm the lucky guy. The head gasket went out on it. Because it's a hybrid, it needed to be done at the dealership. $2,700 to fix it. I looked it up on Kelly Blue Book. Guess what it was worth? $2,700. It's a 2012. This is, I mean, this was in 2020, last December. I thought, why would I put $2,700 into a car that's only worth $2,700? So we went looking for a car. We go to Toyota. Roger Nicewander was a good Christian guy there, a friend of mine, known him for years, and I always deal with him. So I talked to Roger, and I said, show me what you got, Roger. So they had their Priuses and their Camrys on sale on the lot. I decided I wanted to move up to a Camry hybrid. And they had them on sale on the lot, but all they had was black and white. I'm not a black and white type guy. I like red. (laughs) Or at least gray, not black and white. So we looked at them, and I said, Roger, I, I, they had them on sale. They were $28,000, had them for $26,000. And by the way, I'm not saying this to brag, but this is something you can learn, young people. When we paid the Prius off, we kept putting the payment away for five years, saving for the next car. So price tag wasn't a problem. But I had a savings account that had the money in it to buy that car. These were the low model. It's just the stripped-down model. I told Roger, I said, Roger, I don't want black or white, and Cindy didn't either. Let's see what else you can find. So he started looking at some other dealerships. This was in December. Came up with some other things, and finally I said, Roger, don't you have any 2020s left? Because this is December of 2020. He said, well, you know what? I got one. It's a dealer car. They put it into service last January, and because of COVID, it didn't hardly get driven. In fact, it had 200 and something miles on it. But it was already almost a year in service. 
I'm, I'm not exaggerating, 200 and something miles. I don't remember the exact number. And Roger said, I could talk to my boss about that. I think he'd kind of like to get rid of that. We've had it for almost a year. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, it's cherry red. <laughs> but it's not the, the regular one like you're seeing out a lot. It's an SE. It's got the wheels. It's got everything on it. The only thing it didn't have on it was heated seats, and Cindy made me buy those for our anniversary. I mean, it's loaded. She said, are you sure you're on a red car? You'll get a ticket. Probably, but it'll be worth it. So we get this car, and she figures out right away, I love this car. I called it my car, even though she drives it a lot too. So three weeks ago, we're going to Memphis. Some of you have heard this story. We're going to Memphis. We're on I-55 South, right before you get to the bridge, right after I-40 cuts off from it, if you know the area. We're in two or three lanes of traffic. There's a motorcycle group. I mean, I don't mean like Hell's Angels, but a gang of motorcycles, okay, on this side of me. I'm in the middle lane, and there's a truck over here. Speed limit there is 65 miles an hour. I'm driving 65 miles an hour. There's a pickup truck or something I don't remember exactly in front of me, but something that sets high up off the ground. Prius sets way down low to the ground. And he goes over this huge chunk of concrete. I'm right behind him, and I see it as it's coming. Now, I can kill a motorcycle guy, or I can wreck with a big truck. So I chose the concrete. So I hit the concrete. It was high enough that if I'd been in a bigger car, a higher car, it wouldn't have touched anything. It was big enough that it didn't get the bumper, it didn't tear up any of the paint on the outside, but it went underneath and it banged around. And it was so loud when we hit that big chunk of concrete at 65 miles an hour that the guys on the motorcycles looked over because it sounded like a bomb going off. It did huge damage. Now, we didn't know that. I got across the bridge. I pulled off. We looked. Nothing's leaking. I think we're good. So we drove home in it a couple days later. I took it on Tuesday and took it to Toyota. I said, I need you to check out. I know there's some plastic stuff behind the wheel, some rubber stuff behind the wheel damaged. I don't know if it did anything else or not. I need you to put it on the racks and check it out for me. The guy comes back. They don't do this very often. The guy comes to the waiting room and gets me and says, come with me. I knew this wasn't going to be good. He got it up on the racks. He says, look at this. The tire has a gash on the inside about that long, and it could have just barely been missing the air on the inside. It was deep. The wheel above that gash has a crack, a literal crack in the wheel. You know those fancy rims that come on that car? It's cracked up like this. And then there's this piece of the frame right there, and it's got a huge dent in the frame and split open. And I couldn't see this at the time, but evidently it went past that, hit my floorboard, and dented my floorboard on the, on, the, on the underneath side. Needless to say, I'm still driving a rental car. I don't know what the damage is going to be. I know they consider it a road hazard, so I'm only out 500 bucks. But I'm praying they don't total my good car. You know what my wife said? You love that car too much. God took it away for a while. That's what she said, really. Can you believe a woman would say that to me? You know what? She's probably right. I mean, there's not many possessions I care that much about, but I love that car. So I guess God's teaching me a lesson. He kept us safe in the process. I, they don't even know how to fix it yet. It's been two weeks. They're still trying to figure out how to fix it the right way. I mean, they may literally cut the whole floorboard out of the car and put a new floorboard underneath. I don't know what they're going to do. But my point is this. We have possessions, and that's okay. But our possessions shouldn't have us. Our love shouldn't be to a car. It shouldn't be to our bank accounts. It shouldn't be to that retirement fund that we're working on. It shouldn't be to anything except the Lord Jesus Christ above all else. The Lord Jesus Christ above all else. If you put anything in front of him, then it's an idol. Last one, ourselves, our careers, our possessions, and finally, 
And this is a good thing, but our families, our families, think about that. We should love our spouse. We should love our children. We should love our parents. We should honor our parents and take care of them when they get old. We should do all of those things. But when that love is put above our love for God, put in the place where we should adore God, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. I've been guilty of that too. Some of you may remember when we first found out Cindy's cancer was back and it was in her bones. I said, Lord, if I lose her, I'm done. I'm done. By the time he worked on me for a week, I said, Lord, I'll serve you no matter what. But even then, it's been hard. And just a couple weeks ago, when we were going through this stuff with it not getting better like we're hoping it will, but not getting worse either, finally one morning I said, Lord Jesus, I think I've done this, but I give her to you. She's yours. If you take her, I'll love you. And you let me keep her, I'll love you. But she's yours. And I know you want the very best for her. And so she's yours. If we love our families more than we love the Lord, we're in a bad place. It's sin. It's idolatry. So worship ought to always be the first thing in our prayer lives. It ought to be first. We're busy. We shoot out a prayer. God, kids are this. This kid's sick. This kid's sick. My wife needs you, Lord. Uh, and we never get to worship. And we miss it. Worship should be first. And right in the area of worship should be repentance. We'll get to that next time. Are you a Christian who worships? If you are arrested because you worship in a way that people can see it in your life, would you be found guilty? Do you worship to the point that the Lord is honored by it? Do you worship when you come into this building to the point that you honor God and the glory of the Lord fulfills, comes down and fills your heart? Sometimes we just haven't learned to worship. And let me be clear. It's not about what's on the outside. You can jump a pew and holler up and down and still be in the flesh. It's about what's on the inside. Do you truly worship? Sometimes I don't. But it's rare when I'm sitting there during the time of worship that God doesn't touch my heart. Took three songs today. When we got to the third one, man, God touched my heart this morning. Brought tears to my eyes. Do you truly, truly worship? Let's stand for an invitation time. If you are arrested for worship, would there be enough evidence to convict you? This is going to be a series of sermons where there may be some public decisions. But I'm telling you, what needs to happen every Sunday in your heart is, Lord, help me with that area. If it's wonderful, great. But I don't know about you, I can always use some help in that area. So do business with God this morning as we sing and then as we have time to pray.
your heads, and I'm going to ask you some questions. First of all, when is the time you set aside to be with God on a daily basis? And where does it happen at? When and where? And if you can't answer that question, what a better time than right now to commit to the Lord to a time and a place. Whatever that is that works for you. For me, it works in the morning best. Some people do it at night before they turn in. Some people do it in the, at a time in the day when they know they're going to be free and have an hour at lunch or whatever when, when they have time where they could do it. When is your time and where is it? And if you don't have that commitment right now, I'm asking the Lord to touch your heart cause you to make that commitment not a resolution not a new year's thing it's not new year's anyway a decision between you and god that you're going to do your best to honor you'll fail sometimes but a decision between you and god that you're going to do your best to spend that time honoring him what would you commit to him right now Secondly, if you're already doing that, is worship a part of that time? You spend time in prayer just praising God for what he's done for you. You thank him for all the blessings in your life. Do you worship him just because of who he is? Do you worship him because of the cross, because of the resurrection, and because he has pulled you into his kingdom with his spirit? not make a commitment before him to start your time that way third question do you worship when you come into this house when you come in is there joy in the house of the Lord in your life are you really giving it the effort that it deserves I mean you're here anyway why not God will bless you for it. Make that commitment to make this time on Sunday morning, Sunday night if you're here, a time of true worship. Let's sing that again. I worship you. Sing. I worship you. couple of things before Jim comes. Uh, first of all, the Young at Heart group that I'm taking to Branson, we're leaving Wednesday morning. I think several places in around the church it says 9 o'clock. If you come at 9 o'clock, you'll miss the bus, okay? We're leaving at 8. So uh, if you don't have a schedule yet, I have one with your name on it. So see me, all right? If not, I'll give it to you on Wednesday. But we are leaving at 8 a.m. on Wednesday. We're going to have a great time and uh, looking forward to that. Also, I want to remind you that Finance Committee, we're meeting right after Sunday school, and tonight we have business meeting at 5.30. It's an important business meeting because we're going to be voting to spend the money we need to spend to build the building we need to build for our uh, food pantry and the, free, the house, the freezer that we've already bought. Jim? Again, we want to welcome you. We would encourage you to fill out the attendance sheets and place them in the offering basket as they receive them in a few minutes. Uh, we want to remind those that are in adult uh, three, that's John A's class and the ladies three class, uh, that's Kathy Watkins class, that you're switching rooms today. Uh, the ladies will go to 102 and uh, adult three will go to 132. So 
remember uh, that. Also, Wednesday night, we'll be having prayer meeting and uh, uh, Bible study. The uh, study is this end. We also want to remind you about Awana and uh, the youth group that will be meeting then, too. I think that's about it. So... Hi, I am so excited because Shannon and I are planning this event, and I I'm just really hope that there's a lot of families who can take part because I think it could be so awesome. So uh, we are going to do a family camp out, and this is going to be at the Benton Campgrounds, so not far from here, and they have cabins, so or uh, dorms really, so we can stay in the dorms, or you can bring a tent with your family and set up a tent there, but it's going to be October 8th and 9th, so... Uh, it's just going to be overnight that Friday into about midday Saturday. And we have uh, Friday night is going to be our sort of our big event. The whole church is invited to come out to the campground. We're going to have burgers and hot dogs and we'll have a, a bonfire. We'll have worship together. So if you want to come just for that portion, we would love to have you there as well. Um, but if you want to come and camp out, either way, whichever one you want to do, if you want to do both or whatever, we have a sign-up sheet in the lobby on that bulletin board as you pass almost to the library. And there's some questions on there we really need from you because we're going to just go ahead and get the food supplies bought. And then we'll need some people to work the kitchen for different meals. So uh, we need to know who's coming. But we really hope everyone will, uh, those who can, will be able to, to make it out. Uh, we're going to do a craft activity Saturday morning. We'll do some sports events. So all the information that we could think of to conclude is on the back of the little flyers. They're right outside this door. And there's some, I believe, at the gym door as well. So grab a flyer and then think about it. But don't think too long because that's only, uh, what, three weekends from now? So it's coming up. But we want to take advantage of the weather being great. It'll be a little cooler than it's been. So we're really excited. And we hope you can join us, spread the word, get some other families to come, and uh, just join us for a great time. Thank you. As you can see on the screen, Ken Freeman will be back the day after that on October the 10th. He's going to be here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're going to take Friday and Saturday off. He's going to be here the next Sunday. We're hoping to have a huge baptism service on that second Sunday. But we're excited about him coming back again. And uh, so you can be looking forward to that as well. And uh, we're excited about what the Lord wants to do there. Don't forget tonight, worship at 6, business meeting before that at 5.30. Ushers, if you'll come at this time, we'll receive our offering. Also, don't forget a one on Wednesday on Wednesday nights. Our one is off to a good start, and uh, things are going well. The the Bible study on the end by David Jeremiah was pretty full last week, and that's a great Bible study. Come and be part of that as well in room four nineteen. All right, I think they've got the offering done. Let's stand for a closing prayer. Like Chris Lambert is our deacon of the week, and is there a mic over there somewhere? Oh, Chris, lead us in our closing prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come here and worship you. And Lord, I just pray that as we do worship, we realize that worship means just as much as on Sunday, but it's Monday through Saturday also. And that we worship each and every day and we have the opportunity to get closer and closer to you with that personal relationship we have. Lord, be with our military as they watch over and protect us. Be with our leaders that your spirit will lead them to you, that you will show them the truth, the truth that you have for what we need to be doing here on earth. Just guide us and direct us, Lord. Forgive us. Thank you so much for the blessings that you give us each and every day. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love and your forgiveness of sin. And just thank you for your son who died on the cross for us and rose again so that we can even have a conversation with you. Guide us and direct us as we go this week. Give us the opportunities to lead others to you and give us the opportunity to show your love to whoever we come in contact with, that they will see Christ through us in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.